Coming up on Digital Music Trends 167, recorded on the 22nd of January 2014, Beats Music launches in the US, Kim.com soft launches Baboom, Spotify's merch integration goes live, Ardeo goes freemium and much more! Oh, hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as audio and video on a variety of channels, including iTunes, the most podcasting apps, including Downcast if you have it, YouTube uh, as video, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, and Audio Boo. So to get in touch with the show, you can tweet, tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends. And uh, also, if you want to have a look at DigitalMusicTrends.com, there's now a voluntary subscription option. So if if you enjoy the show and uh, are able to or want to uh, help support it then you can uh, have a look over there and there's uh, a few different options for monthly subscriptions and uh, uh, this week it's a fantastic uh, show we're gonna, have, we're gonna have so much to talk about really and uh, I've got uh, three great guests uh, to do that with so first up uh, a new guest uh, Lucas Gonza a CTO at uh, two secondline.tv sorry secondline.tv uh, a platform to stream shows online and Lucas was also product manager in the early days of Mog. So, hey, and how's it going? It's going great. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to have you. And uh, then it's a real pleasure to welcome back uh, Eamon Ford, uh, who writes uh, for Music Ally as well as, a no as well as a number of other publications. So, hi, Eamon, and uh, great to have you on. Hello, thanks for having me back. I didn't, I didn't get you sued the last time I was on, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And uh, it's also great to welcome back Adam Webb, a freelance writer and PR consultant. So hi, Adam, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me back, Andrea. And so uh, this week, uh, you know, last week I tried to avoid uh, my hardest to avoid Beats Music as I knew that this week we had to talk about it. It would be impossible really to avoid talking about it given that the service launched uh, on Tuesday in the US. So uh, Beats Music is built on top of a uh, music streaming service Mog, uh, which Beats uh, acquired in late 2012. Uh, Mog itself has been announced will shut down on April the 15th as Beats uh, uh, pushes to migrate users from one service to the other. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, Beats Music has been uh, well publicized as it shows uh, a human uh, aspect uh, aspect of music curation by hiring a bunch of people from different radio stations and and uh, from different music journalism uh, backgrounds and also uh, got publications like Pitchfork, Rolling Stone and even The Ellen Show in the US to put together uh, uh, what appear to be well thought out playlists uh, to help users navigate through the catalog of the company. So uh, the service as I mentioned is US only for now and there is no timeline or international launch as of yet but it has had some uh, pretty good reviews from, uh, for example, Harry McCracken on Time, uh, Mike Snyder on USA Today, and also uh, Joanna Stern on the Wall Street Journal. They've all had pretty good takes uh, on the service so far. So first up, I want to do a round of uh, sort of first impressions from you guys. I know that uh, in the UK, we, may, in the UK, we might, may, may not have uh, been able to try the service as of yet, but at least your overall thoughts uh, um, as far as the, the screenshots and, and the, and the uh, reviews that you, you've seen so far. So uh, maybe we should start with uh, Lucas, because uh, Lucas, you also worked at uh, Mog, so you might have a bit of more of an inside track on, 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 on uh, you know, the development of the service uh, or not. But I just want to hear your thoughts on, on Beats Music today and uh, what, what you make of the launch. Indeed. Um, I should also mention um, another key part of my background was to work at Yahoo Music, uh, right. where I worked for Ian Rogers. Um, so, um, so I'm close to many people um, who are currently at Beats. Um, the, um, the first takeaway from, uh, from the Beats launch that I found was it is a iteration on the idea of on-demand services uh, and of the digital music sector as a whole. Um, they, they really do advance the product category um, and, um, and they um, you know, have been in um, this product category really from the beginning. Yahoo Music Unlimited launched in 2006 as uh, the second on-demand product, and it was really closely modeled on Rhapsody, um, which you know innovated the category. Um, and um, uh, the that that first generation was about catalog surfing. Rhapsody, in particular, was a big hierarchy of artists, albums, and tracks, and you walked through that hierarchy basically um, with a little bit of search. Um, and then, um, at the same time as that stuff was going on, the webcasting world had non-interactive solutions. Um, and the on-demand and, and non-interactive worlds have kind of proceeded on their own tracks for the last, you know, 10 years, seven or eight years, really. Um, 
so this uh, represents um, an iteration that, that uh, crosses those two lines of development. Um, it, it aims to provide a good lean back, non-interactive experience that um, empowers the user, the listener, to have an on-demand experience when they're moved to. So if they want to bookmark a particular song, if they want to search, if they want to play the same song over and over again, if they want to skip however many tracks they want, they can do that. And at the same time, they're not obligated to do like they would with Rhapsody or Yahoo Music Unlimited, Ian Rogers' background, or Mog. Um, they're not obligated to surf the catalog and find things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty that's pretty interesting. And uh, looking at you know the the playlist side of things, it looks like they've uh, done a very extensive job uh, at at creating stuff that uh, people might want to listen to. And uh, as as the reviews come in, it looks like uh, most reviewers are finding that the tracks that they are getting are pretty relevant to their current uh, you know uh, likes and dislikes. So that's that's definitely a plus for the service right now. Uh, and uh, Amon, you know, what are your thoughts on the service? Uh, do you think that this could be uh, something that brings people, uh, brings streaming into the mainstream, uh, on-demand streaming into the mainstream, uh, similarly to how you know Pandora brought internet radio into the mainstream and makes it a little bit easier for people to navigate immense catalogs of uh, that are available right now on streaming services? Yeah, I think. Uh, oh well, it's a bit early to say it's good yeah. into the industry. I think this the, the very nature of on-demand streaming and a ten pound a month subscription <clears throat> automatically puts a ceiling on your potential audience. You're not going to go and get the mainstream consumers because the the a terrible fact that the music industry doesn't like to face up to is the fact that most people aren't that fussed about music. They kind of like it in the background. They're not obsessive, and the music industry is or should be populated by music obsessives, and that kind of skews the perspective of the consumer and the consumers are happy there's a lot of consumers happy buying one or two new albums a year and listening to radio and that's where something like pandora works really well because it's put on in the background it does all the heavy lifting for you whereas when you present it with 25 million songs on spotify or beats or audio or deezer or napster or any of these services it's quite overwhelming and lots of people would just go well they don't they don't really want to hear that they don't want to hear all this obscure stuff they 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 want to kind of listen to the charts and that's absolutely fine so i think beats is probably the most well thought out service, certainly based on the reviews and the and the screenshots that I've seen, and I'm really excited to actually use it because much as I love Spotify, I think the interface is quite terrible. It looks like it looks like a really terrible version of iTunes, which in itself is possibly the worst piece of music software ever released onto a public and people <laughs> expect it to use it. It's awful. That's iTunes I'm talking about rather than Spotify. Spotify yeah. app has been updated recently and is a little bit better, but it's still it's not a nice kind of user experience. I think what's happening under the bonnet, as they say, is phenomenal. But I think the the look and feel of it needs a lot of work. And I think yeah. Spotify would admit that, and they're slowly evolving that. And hopefully they don't go the way that iTunes did and make a terrible thing even worse. With every <laughs> uh, but it, I'm glad that they took... It, it's pretty much a year from Ian Rogers being appointed to them, them going live with the service. And I'm glad that they took a year to actually look at the things that other services are doing well, but more importantly, look at the things that the other services are doing badly. And I think that, I think it's, it's going to kind of raise the bar for a lot of the other, other services. I think they're going to look slightly fusty compared to, to Beats. And I think the experience, so that automatically gives Beats a massive head start uh, in the market. But then again, it's that whole thing of converting people to, uh, to stump up money for it. But I think the most intriguing thing they've done is that deal with AT&T, uh, the $15 a month deal to get up to five people. Yeah. On a subscription that's phenomenal i think i think that's that i think you that's the real play for the mainstream i think so if it's bundled i don't know uh how good at at and t is as a as a mobile operator in the u.s they're, i think they're, they're the second biggest are they it's no it's the biggest i reckon oh it's it i reckon so yeah okay and, and uh, one of the two best right okay so it's it's it, 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 People get good connections. It's a good service, that kind of thing. Right? Okay. I mean, it's got. I think it's got awful customer customer service reviews, uh, at least averages. But does it not? That's, that's, that's in, in call quality. Oh, like okay. They were loathsome, terrible vendor. That right. they're <laughs> horrible to. <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully, 
actually, yeah, it's. Uh, I think it should kind of make everybody else up their game, and I think that's got to be really good for the consumer. And I think it was really interesting their statement. They came out and they said that everybody's getting paid exactly the same. Or yeah. Else, or all the labels are getting paid exactly the same, which that's that's intriguing considering by default Universal have an interest in the service uh, with Jimmy Iovine and uh, all that. So that's intriguing, and I think it's also the fact that they've got lots of artists involved and they're making a real play to be seen as very artist friendly given the kind of the meltdown last yeah. year with Tom York and David Byrne and, and Spotify kind of became the whipping boy for all of that. Uh, even though obviously Spotify was the biggest service, but sure. a lot of the criticisms that those people were leveling at Spotify could be equally applied to Rhapsody and Deezer and, uh, and everybody else about yeah. these kind of micro payments. So it, it's interesting that they're, they seem very, focused on the consumer in terms of the experience and the price point and the bundles and very focused on the artists and those those are the two bits that had kind of been forgotten a little bit in this great technological rush it was very much just get the stuff out there and get the deals and get the indies on and get the majors in and i think the the consumer and the artists had kind of been left kind of going well this is it this is the train jump on it or be run over by it yeah. and i think it's it's really good that they seem to be focusing on both the consumer and the artist. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. Adam, from a, from a PR perspective, you know, uh, do you find that the way that they set up the release uh, to be sort of a, a master stroke of PR and the way that they, you know, set up, set up expectations and then, uh, you know, uh, sort of in a, in a almost like an understated way because a lot of the communications really were done through Ian's personal blog or through, through sort of more informal channels rather than uh, big uh, press conferences. So how, how do you feel about the way that they went about releasing the service uh, out in the open? Um. I mean, I think it's interesting when they've they've set out some pretty sort of key messages around the curation. And obviously, it was interesting. The I think it was the the, the weekend before last. There was like every single U.S. broadsheet I think was carrying a you know carrying um, details around it. Um, I mean, obviously, from from our from our um, our side of the pond, it's, it's it's really difficult to make any assessments without actually you know playing around with it and uh, and um, and um, you know and seeing it in action. Um, I mean, I think that I mean for me the the. I mean, I mean, I think obviously the successes or a lot of the successes will probably be dependent upon, you know, the brand itself of, of Beats Music and also those partnerships. Um, I mean, the one the one thing I do wonder about, though, is, is who is it actually aimed at? Yeah. Um, I mean, obviously, a lot of the partnerships with, you know, Ellen and Target and Super Bowl are incredibly mainstream. I, and again, I, I don't know whether those people are bothered about curation, would pay nine ninety nine for it um, um, and so on. And, and and then you know conversely, if it's for the cool early adopters who maybe would pay that nine ninety nine, a lot of those people are going to be on streaming services already. So you're talking about you know trying to trying to pull people away from you know Spotify users or Groove Shark users or, or whoever else. Um, so I think there's some really interesting you know there's some really in interesting questions there. And, and I mean I did it was uh, sort of interesting note a couple of tweets that Ian put out um, this week. I mean basically saying you know if music isn't worth hundred dollars a year to you, I'm afraid we live our lives differently. Give it a trial. If you spend a thousand dollars a year on cable and won't spend a hundred dollars a year on music, we can't be friends. I mean, they're quite they're quite bullish statements gi given how competitive yeah. that market are and given how you know compelling a lot of free services are. So it's you know it's going to be it's obviously going to be quite fascinating how it how that rolls out over the next. I, you know, moment. I, lo I like that 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 kind of side of it because I think well uh, you obviously worked with Ian and I've, I've interviewed him quite a few times and he's a really passionate, intelligent guy and I was when they appointed him I was going right okay this is this isn't going to be a, just a run of the mill service this 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 service is going to be really good because they've got really good people in there and I think like he's he's kind of it's. For a CEO or a senior exec to be talking like that, that's not, that's, I haven't interviewed lots of these people, these heads of service, they don't speak like that, which is, for a journalist anyway, is incredibly refreshing. And the fact that he put up a blog last year, which was basically saying, this is how you can disconnect your streaming service from Facebook and all of that, and we're never going to do that, and uh, uh, cut, out, cut out the crap, I think, was the line that he used. And I thought that, and I think... He's he's still got that feeling that he's a pander, he's a person actually using this service rather than somebody who's there to kind of drive up the share price and profitability and stuff like that. I think he's very much approaching it from the perspective of a music fan, which yeah. I really I really like that. And I think it's it's mm. that's a really interesting it's a really good 
breath of fresh air because you speak to these people and they they speak in kind of corporate terminology and it's all a bit bland it's about curation and user experience and, and a lot of that stuff that doesn't mean anything and i think he, he kind of puts it in human terms which yeah. i like yeah i think it goes back to the beats headphone um strategy product strategy which is to speak an emotional and cultural language rather than a technical and economic language hmm. so beats headphones are aspirational they, they're big they're statements. They're something you wear, uh, and the, um, the 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 same bass that is booming and excessive to uh, to most grown-ups um, is exactly um, you know right to the heart of the cultural language of hip hop and contemporary pop and R and B. Um, so Beats headphones succeeded by speaking the cultural language very well. Yeah. So by hiring Ian, who's a passionate guy who, who genuinely loves music. And who has good ears, um, and who has real ears, and he's he's into it. He really um, genuinely loves music with his heart. Um, by hiring him, uh, Beats kind of put um, music and emotion and feeling and art at the center of their of their pitch uh, and of their um, of their market statement. And that's really their value proposition in a lot of ways. We are about music and art. Feeling, emotion, style, social life, and all those other things that you're really seeking by potentially acquiring this product. No, that makes absolute sense. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, uh, last point on, on, on Beats, I want, I want to ask you, Lucas, uh, you know, do you feel like uh, a lot of the technology over which the service was built was already there uh, through Mog and a lot of what they had to do was uh, mostly on the design side and the curation side of the new application? Or do you think there was a lot of work in the background as well to, to change the, the tech to make the service work the way it does now? Um, I think... So I, I don't really know the inside details of that, sure. which is surprising because I know people who are very close to the process. Um, but I, I know that the, the engineering leads at MOG actually have not continued at, at Beats. Right. Um, and the key data architect isn't there anymore. Um, but that said, um, I think they probably use the, the back-end systems, the main Ruby on Rails app and the Sinatra code and um, what, you know, whatever else was sitting around at that time as the core, uh, uh, dealing with the data components of a music service, no matter what your front end marketing message is, is a very nerdy job. Right. Um, and uh, to give an example, uh, Mog, had, Mog really excelled at search. If you do a music search um, in, in Mog that's pretty sloppy, it's like um, Oliver Nelson Truth. Um, if you, if you, you'll get the right thing, Oliver Nelson and the Search for the Abstract Truth and the Abstract Truth, and because the album I'm thinking of. If you do the same thing on audio, um, it'll try, it'll look for an album with those three words in the title and totally bomb out and Spotify and so on. So, Mark did a great job with those core data components, and I imagine those uh, were carried over. Absolutely, that 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 that's really quite fun. And I remember you know, I had a. I had a, 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 a TJ uh, follower, I think the, the VP of product at Mog back uh, at Panel South by in 2012, and they had a very, uh, you know, uh, you know, determined and a, a, a great vision as to where they wanted recommendation to go. So I'm sure that they, when the, the company was picked up, there was already a vision of where that that was going in, in a certain sense. Uh, and I, I want to sort of move on for a second away from streaming services. We're going to go back to that in, in, in a moment, but I want to talk about a sort of a, a, a random thing that happened this week because uh, also Amon has a bit of a an inside track to give us uh, this week and uh, I want to talk about Kim.com because he uh, the founder of uh, Mega Upload has a soft launch his latest uh, music project uh, called Baboom uh, so the site only showcases a demo page and a surprise surprise it's uh, uh, Kim.com's own profile with his own music that he decided to release on the platform uh, there's also a short video on the platform where uh, Kim.com uh, explains uh, that his vision is uh, to uh, have artists give away their music for free as a download and then fans pay for the music afterwards if they decide they really like it so uh, he decided to give his, his own music away for free to try and prove this model and try to to show that he really believes in it uh, you know you can choose a variety of different formats there's a bunch of things you can do and and then you can, uh, the, the page looks a bit like a myspace crossed over with a sort of online version of itunes or sort of like a, some sort of uh, online mp3 store and it does have a few links to itunes amazon.com and bandcamp as commercial outlets for the music so uh, amon uh, first up uh, you know when you, you spoke with uh, uh, 
Kim.com uh, this week, I think, and, and there was actually a piece of music ally that, that came out that I'm going to link into the show notes. It came out just a couple of hours ago, actually. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, sorry, what were you going to wh- say? Wh- what are your thoughts? Oh, it's there's a lot of stuff happening here. Or there's a, there's a lot of stuff uh, he claims is happening here. So uh, I interviewed him. I think it was last week. I can remember. And it's uh, well, this is Wednesday evening. This is being recorded. So uh, a quite a long Q and A uh, has gone up on the Music Alley website, and uh, a kind of a written up interview with him in the report coming out uh, this afternoon or this evening as well. And there's lots of stuff happening there, and so it was kind of intriguing when you when you're kind of presented with the most evil man in the copyright industry, and he's quite a kind of affable bloke, and he's 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 very smart, and he knows what he's doing. But there's a few interesting things in this, which I think is going to cause people to tie themselves in knots to prove that he is the great campaigner for uh, internet freedom, or he is the great evil enemy of copyright, or whatever. Uh, the first thing is that he's uh, he's done his own, al- own album called Good Times, which is like it's kind of like David Guetta, but not even as good as David Guetta. It's uh, it's it's EDM bangers. It's ki- it's all right, and you kind of feel a bit sorry for him because he's not going to be a pop star. But <laughs> and he turns forty. He turned forty on Tuesday, the day after. So you could read that as some some form of midlife crisis. But his whole emphasis is on uh, kind of improved audio quality so he wants this kind of properly streamed because he's he said that the music deserves that uh he also said that it's going to have a full lunch uh, within six to nine months and it's going to have he said he's got 10 a-list artists signed up to give music away for free he won't say who those are but he claims that they're all ready to go and uh, but the most interesting thing is the business model behind that because you can sign up with a thing called mega key which uh, uh, a bit, bit of software that you install in your computer and <clears throat> he said that uh, in your general browsing on the internet with all the ads that you encounter that will give you enough credit to download between 10 and 15 albums a year, just based on your uh, average browser. But the thing, and this is where it's going to get really intriguing, because if you thought that he was squaring up to Hollywood and the music industry and they were getting upset, he's going for Google with this, because he's basically going to hijack Google's ads yeah. system. That's the way he explained it to me, and he said that uh, roughly 20% of the ads that you see, they're going to basically jump in and then serve their own ads directly to you so they're basically hijacking google's model i don't know if that's legal or not well, it's not essentially sure. it's, a, it's, it's a new version of an ad blocker right instead of blocking yeah. the ads just yeah. replacing. He's, but he's basically then filling that space with his own ad inventory which then he'll say he says he's going to go to the artists and then the the line he said to me he said that, that uh if i'm evil then google or the apex of evil and he sees this as a kind of a, a moral uh, resetting of the of the compass in a way, and he, so th- I think that's going to prove a conundrum for the for the music industry because of if Kim dot com is their enemy and bad Google, i.e., uh, not YouTube and the nice analytics you get from Go- from Google, but that other that that bad evil Google that uh, doesn't uh, downplay uh, piracy results in its search rankings. If Kim dot com's then going against Google to redirect some of Google's ad money back to artists. Who's the who's the bad person here now? I don't know. I think right. this is it's it's like a Gordian knot of of ethics. I think so. Uh, it's going to be. A, I'm really intrigued to see how Google will respond to this because if the music industry are still gunning for him to be uh, deported to the US to stand trial, I don't think Google's going to stand back. And they've got deeper pockets than the music industry because they're uh, they're an industry on the up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Adam, uh, you know, so we see Kim.com trying to change the conversation here uh, from you know uh, I am you know from him being portrayed as the the evil monster of the, of the music industry or the or rights world uh, to being sort of somebody that is trying to actually generate more revenue for artists. Uh, do you see that being? Uh, ever uh, successful given how ingrained the sort of mistrust between the music industry and uh, his enterprises is right now i don't know i mean I, it was interesting reading Amos' interview actually i mean he actually he actually was quite uh, he was actually quite pleasant towards the music industry i thought it was more the film industry that he had um yeah uh, more of a beef with really but um um i mean it was interesting you mentioned spiral frog in the piece as well because that was my I, I think Crazy Frog, him and Spiral Frog, the surface to some degree, and there's a there's there's a there's an element almost of novelty I think about him about him now. I mean, the album is obviously a uh, I don't know. I mean, it's 
I know artistic merit is is all is all is all subjective, but it's it sounds pretty crap to me. <laughs> um, so I, I I don't know. I I I I suspect I suspect in my heart of hearts this will you know this will pass without leaving much impact on very much. Although the Google thing is obviously that you know that will be that will be interesting if there's something disruptive to to Google's advertising. Although. I mean, could you explain I mean, what's uh, what is he saying? I mean, who, where, where is he going to drag his advertising on to sort of supplant Google's advertising? Is there any indication there of, of you know, which brands well, may be involved or something? No, he, did, he didn't talk about any of that. He's basically just said that they're they're going to kind of serve their own ad inventory. So they're going to have, a, I guess, they're going to have an ad sales team that then they'll basically just go instead of for every five ads that you might see experience through Google, for example, they'll just jump in on the fifth one and go, ha, ah, this great service or whatever. But then we were having this debate in the Music Ally office yesterday about this. We're going, well, who's who's going to uh, advertise? Because there's obviously it's, a yeah. big issue for blue chip brands to be associated with this sort of stuff and they're getting lobbied by Hollywood and whoever else to pull their ads. So then is it basically going to be... Uh, kind of sex lines and and things like that and Viagra and uh, all the stuff that uh, would get wouldn't couldn't afford to be advertised on I don't know the Guardian site or the New York Times site or might not be allowed to advertise on those sites. So is he is he going to get the run of the litter in terms of uh, advertisers? But then on the flip side, if they've got no other outlet and he's providing that to them, can he kind of crank up the ad rate? So is he? Is this an incredibly clever plan that he's playing or not? Yeah. Wait, 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 wait. The problem here is, is that um, you know it's it's a it's a neat way to create money out of nothingness for him. It's money for nothing for sure from his perspective. But from the advertiser's perspective, they're buying the exact same ad product. The CPC, the actual returns in those ads, are the same from Kim.com uh, as they are from if they buy from Google. Um, and uh, the, the key difference is that from Kim.com, they're less relevant. So Kim.com isn't able to offer greater relevance or greater uh, CPC. Um, he's only able to take money uh, that Google is currently earning, put it in his own pocket, and offer a product that is less valuable from an advertiser perspective. So I'd be very surprised if any advertisers stick with this, except for to the extent that he can maybe charge a lower lower markup on the ads so it's, it's possible that you know it's possible that he can he can find some real um, real junk you know in some real junk inventory in yeah. that sense but for the most part the market has already found equilibrium and there's nothing he's going to do that's going to affect that you know, I think with, with uh, Kim.com um, uh, uh, most most direct parallel is Sarah Palin this is a person who had her moment in the sun, right? Uh, John McCain picked her. It was this kind of freak show, wonderful, entertaining, crazy, disastrous media event. Um, and she went into the, into the feeding pool and uh, it was wonderfully entertaining for a little while. And now she's going to make a living on talk radio for the rest of her career. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, to, to be honest, I can, I can already sort of see in the future and the, the sort of the retrospective show about 2009, 2010, you know, in 2013, and they were like, oh, yeah, remember this guy, King.com. And it's almost, you can almost sense that that's going to be, you know, that's going to well, be happening. Funny you should mention that. A friend of mine just emigrated to New Zealand just before Christmas, <laughs> and he said that it's really bizarre in because obviously Kim.com lives in Auckland, and the reason he said that he lived there is that he's scared there's going to be a third world war. So uh, uh, New Zealand isn't on the uh, kind of the uh, the nuclear bomb strike list, and he said that it's far enough away that if the world gets blown up, you can kind of start from scratch there. I don't know if he's... <laughs> If he's thinking he's in the Lord of the Rings or something, I'm not <laughs> sure. But a friend of mine who uh, emigrated to uh, Auckland, he said that it's really weird because the New Zealand media, or they, they love him, they absolutely love him, and the public seemed to love him. And he was going, I wouldn't bet against this guy entering New Zealand politics in the next couple of years. So you never know. Like we, we're watching several steps from out. So this is a yeah. guy who just moved from London, and he had his views on what Kim dot com was. And then he said, as soon as you go to New Zealand, it's they they don't treat him as this kind of pantomime villain. They actually take him seriously because he paid for the Auckland uh, New Year's Eve fireworks, not last wow. New Year's Eve, the year before. Yeah. yeah. 
So he personally paid for those. I think that was his first kind of response after the raid in his house. It was like almost a year later. He kind yeah. of went, right, okay, I'm going to pay for the fireworks to show that I'm a great citizen of Auckland. <laughs> that sounds like they're easily bought over there. Yeah, so he's basically, <laughs> he's basically the Boris Johnson of uh, <laughs> New Zealand. That, 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 that's a reference that will probably not, not, not make... Uh, Political, it probably doesn't work, but... <laughs> Personality yeah, or, wise, or the Donald Trump of uh, <laughs> of, of New Zealand. <laughs> that, that's funny. Well, yeah, we're gonna keep an eye on it. And uh, you know, as you said, it's difficult to see a service like this really taking hold because you need to acquire users. And it's a different thing for a company like BitTorrent who are planning to have a component of you know free music away and then putting a sort of a a, a roadblock there to be able to uh, allow musicians to either get emails or get payments or get whatever through the BitTorrent bundle uh, stuff. Uh, uh, and they have a huge audience of people that use BitTorrent anyway. Uh, but you know, building a service from scratch is going to be a lot harder, I think, than than doing it the BitTorrent way, essentially. Uh, but um, So I, I wanted to talk about uh, streaming a, a little bit more, just because there's a couple of stories from Spotify as well. Uh, Spotify, of course, uh, uh, had a year's heads up on essentially Beats plans, so uh, it had time to actually uh, uh, not catch up a little bit with some of the plans that, that Beats had in, had in, in store. So for example, they, uh, they launched uh, pretty quickly, actually, after the December announcement, they launched uh, their uh, a merchandising uh, uh, listing uh, for artists so uh, any artist uh, that has an artist page on Spotify can now apply for the artist link uh, platform on Topspin for free and place up to three items of merchandising for sale on the Spotify artist page which is pretty cool uh, it, you know it gives them a lot of exposure and it gives them uh, an outlet to make a little bit more money uh, from Spotify than purely the uh, uh, the, the streaming rates, which are, as we all know, are pretty low, especially for independent artists. They don't generate a huge amount of money. Um, you know, it's interesting also because uh, I think both Spotify and Topspin are foregoing uh, commission on these sales right now. So Spotify is actually, uh, the artists actually make, uh, you know, the lion's share of the money. So, uh, Spotify uh, also this week has lifted uh, listen limits uh, in all of it, uh, all of its international territories. Uh, in some of the territories, there were still listen limits on the free uh, uh, ad-supported component of the service. Uh, uh, but apparently now they are, they, are uh, they managed to uh, balance uh, their income from advertising uh, in a way that allows them to make uh, ad-supported uh, uh, streaming uh, unlimited for everyone, uh, both on desktop and on mobile devices, as announced uh, in the past couple of months. So. Uh, uh, Pick your battle. I mean, uh, I think the merchandising uh, side is pretty interesting from, from my end, just because I want, I'm keen on seeing what the results are going to be from that. Uh, and uh, uh, Lucas, do you think that they're going to see a wide adoption from artists right from the get-go? And how can that affect, affect Topspin as well? Because, I mean, that's, that's a company that hadn't perhaps been in the mainstream eye as much as, uh, as would have liked to, to have been, but this really puts them at the forefront of, of, uh, uh, of merchandise and sales, both on, on Beats and on Spotify, right? Well, the merchandise is not, it's not that easy to get to on Spotify. It is there if you do a little bit of digging, and I imagine that it's going to move some units and bring in a little bit of incremental revenue. And compared to the streaming revenue, it could even be very significant, um, given that the streaming revenue tends to be um, quite low in the short term. Right. Um, the, um, the merch integration in Beats, I haven't come across yet in my using the app for a day. Um, and I doubt it'll be that front and center. But I think that um, I think that merch for some artists is a very significant part of their business plan. For example, the Ramones, I think, make much more on t-shirt sales than they do on albums. And as an artist, you know, as a as a business entity, that's their business much more. Um, like the music helps sell the t-shirts. So depending on the artist, um, merch can be very significant. Um, I think that the merch needs to be integrated into the value proposition a little bit more. Yep. It is, for some artists, listeners are looking for the merch. And for example, if you're a Ramones fan, you want to see the t-shirt front and center. Whereas if you're a Radiohead fan, I don't know what product you want to see, but there's some product you want to see. And the the software and the user experience should be leading you to that product that embodies the value that you get from the music. I don't think that this is front and center in either of those products yet. Yeah. Um, I think more that it's about good relationships with the artists, which obviously have been very hard for Spotify. 
Um, but I don't think the dynamics, as far as artists are concerned, are going to change with beats. And I imagine in two days, I mean, start your watch. You know, if David Lowry and David Byrne are going to have loud, complaining pieces um, that get a lot of press, despite the fact that they are numerically illiterate and um, you know not true with the data and um, you know don't really serve artists. Right, uh, guys. Do you think that uh, Spotify, uh, you know, can has changed the conversation at this point? You know, do you think we're going to see uh, as many complaints about the service uh, this year as we saw last year, given all the moves that it's making in opening up its data and allowing for merchandise sales on the platform? Is this going to appease the majority of the artists? Oh, I, I don't think. Well, there'll be, there'll be all these people who don't really like it, but I think they they've kind of. Not shifted the blame, but I think they were taking a lot of the pain on behalf of the labels because yeah. they they pay out and right, and then they 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 are not involved in what percentage goes through to the artists. So people like Beggars Group have come out and said they play fifty fifty. You hear certain deals that artists are on major labels are maybe only getting fifteen percent. Uh, so I think. I think maybe that those hysterical kind of uh, debates on both sides, those kind of saying Spotify is the most evil thing uh, out there or Spotify is the most perfect thing out there. I think those two extremes, those two fanatical debates, I think will hopefully fall by the wayside. I think also this year is going to be a really tough year. I think this year is going to see some services go to the wall or be swallowed up by other services. I think it's incredibly difficult out there. While... People complain about how little artists are getting paid. If you actually look at the uh, the P and Ls, a lot of these services are running in the red, and they have been for a long time. Pandora is still losing money, even though it's got it's got kind of mass adoption. So yeah. trying to make the numbers add up is going to be incredibly difficult. But I think the 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 merchandise move, I think, is an interesting political one. I'll be I'd be intrigued to see what kind of revenue it drives because. Uh, people kind of forget that in the early days of Spotify, they had a download store that yeah. they very quietly got rid of because uh, it wasn't doing any kind of numbers. And obviously it kind of was contradicting the, the, the business model. But I think if I, I was actually just speaking to Ian Hogarth at Songkick earlier today about not not about this, but about something else. But I would, I'd spoke to him about how, because Songkick had kind of been the guinea pig for a lot of this doing the, the gig list and things, which was kind of slowly integrated last year. And they said that it was an incredible driver for traffic. They were seeing huge engagement and they were re he was really effusive about it. But that was, obviously, they weren't making a lot of money out of that. They were getting their affiliate ticket sales or whatever else. That wasn't the core of their business. They saw this as a nice way to kind of drive people to discover gigs. Yeah. But he said that they were seeing interesting engagement there. So, But whether or not people feel the same about buying merchandise as they do about buying gig tickets yeah. it's, is another debate entirely. Of course, you will have people like the Ramones were on One Direction where merchandise is a huge part of what they do. I don't think uh, the Ramones and One Direction have been kind of paralleled in that way before. That's a first for you. Uh, but it'll be... <laughs> I'm just intrigued to see how, how people react to this yeah. because they obviously they tested it when they got the Led Zeppelin catalogue and it was buy Led Zeppelin t-shirts. And that's a thing that will sell because those Led Zeppelin American Tour 77 t-shirts are classics and people really like that kind of vintage look. But I think for the smaller artists, I don't know, maybe will they see kind of better money coming through Bandcamp rather than through Spotify, which kind of be then begs that wider question about do small artists really benefit beyond the the promotion side on Spotify, do they benefit financially? Are they much better off? Will they see a lot better revenue coming from the likes of Bandcamp and keeping yeah. it a bit more kind of homespun cottage industry rather than in here? You, yeah, the, they'll sell loads of Zeppelin t-shirts and Stones t-shirts and whoever else, but other artists don't necessarily merchandise. I done. mean... Uh, one thing that I was thinking about, well, it's not just about, you know, T-shirts, of course, you know, uh, thinking about the audience that Spotify caters to when you, you think about the full, you know, fully paid service, it's 120 bucks a year. A lot of people that maybe used to buy a lot of music uh, and now convert it to Spotify and buy less music because of that, uh, they might still be interested in having, having some uh, physical artifacts to hold m music wise because, you know, they, they really love music. And so in that sense, if the merchandise, if you shift the conversation to it being actual, you know, vinyls or, or art editions or more interesting pieces around the music itself, then maybe there's this something there in lifting sales of, of vinyls that we've seen, have seen a massive resurgence in the last couple of years. Uh, that could be interesting, right? 
Mm. I mean, I think I think you know the 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 potential for a streaming service to be a, a conduit to a you know a closer relationship with an artist is is a is a really strong proposition. And uh, ironically, when it was first announced about Ian Rogers um, and, and and Daisy, it was at that point you know that the whole play being made there was was that um, 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 Beats were going to be making a. Um, um, an investment in top spin and there was going to be a big artist integration I mean, that was a, a, a year ago that's what that's what the you know that was that was the that was the spin being put about about what this new service is going to be and i think that was interesting now that you know spotify that sort of got there first with 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 top spin is now doing this merch deal all right it's baby steps and you know i doubt whether they're going to flog a hell of a lot of t-shirts but it is it, it's an interesting thing to build upon um, and if you can offer you know offer each artist a space within that streaming service to you know to communicate with fans to offer the assets which are relevant to them you know it might not be t-shirts it might be something else you can then you know you can upsell you can build up the value proposition so i think that that's it's potentially you know on the way towards something quite interesting and something that can maybe help differentiate these services which are quite identical yeah you know away from each other as well so you know that's 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 potentially quite interesting i think I think they need to get into selling groceries as well. I think you need to buy <laughs> bread and milk, all the, all the staples. But yeah, if you're spending so much time sitting in front of your computer, that's what you need to do. Yeah. Yeah, so, so they, they want to disrupt the, uh, the Walmart, uh, Tesco's business model. That's, that's where they should be focused on. Well, they had, a few, uh, they had a few branded apps, right? So you can imagine a Tesco app or a Walmart app in the States. It's, uh, order your groceries while we make the well, best uh, possible why, choice why, of why playlists. Not, why, why, why listening to Brad or... I don't know who else. I mean, I'd love to see the um, the approach to artist merch in an app um, change from being something that's driven by a database of products, where there's a product image, a product description, a price, and so on, and it's displayed in a canned way. I'd like to see a change from that to something where the artist has a little chunk of real estate to play with in the app, mm -hmm. and they decide how they want to allocate that, because they know what their business goals are. They know whether what they need to do is to romance the band, just just establish the relationship with their fans, have better graphics, have changing graphics, have a video. It does, that doesn't have to be directly monetized. Maybe they're a band that is about moving tickets. Their fans want tickets. Well, where they make their money is tickets. Maybe it's the opposite. They're a band that has no need to romance anything. It's you know it's Michael Bublé. Like he's done the romancing. He's got it under his belt. There's no need for additional romancing. And he's sold the tickets. And now he's trying to sell champagne. So I'd love to see that become real estate that the, that the artists control and can do whatever they want with. Maybe yeah, instead the, of album work. Yeah, well, it's, it's kind of going that way because I guess in a way it's what Ping should have been within iTunes, which is this kind of social channel which the artists controlled. But I, I was interviewing uh, some people about the Robbie Williams last album campaign and I spoke to two of the people at IE Music, his management company, and sure. they said that they now treat his profile page in Spotify in exact, they give it the exact same uh, amount of attention as they would on Twitter or Facebook. They, they very much treat this as a social network in its own right. And obviously somebody like a big artist like Robbie Williams in the UK will have a lot of leverage with Spotify to be able to do that. But as that becomes the norm, then yeah, I think artists should be putting all their applying all their efforts into their profile page on Beats or on Spotify and treating it exactly the same way that they do with Facebook. And I think that's going to be really interesting where it's not just a playlist anymore. It's something a bit more than that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's where actually a, a, an application that I've been keeping an eye on for the last uh, couple of years, a band page could actually prove to be quite interesting because, you yeah. know, they have the ability and the APIs to be able to hook into all the services and provide the data that is, you know, that the artist can in decide on. So that's interesting because it means that the artist doesn't have to go to all these different services to uh, to update its information on Beats, on RDO, on Spotify and all the other platforms. But there could be a central point where uh, to distribute the information from if there is a wider inter integration of that, of that I platform. Think, I think they're going to have to put design limits on it. Otherwise, it's going to be like uh, MySpace seven years ago <laughs> with people right. with these cascading glittery backgrounds. <laughs> and it's, I think they should. They they've got a very finite amount of real estate on that window, and I think they. they I think kind of uh, brand guidelines and style sheets need to be given out to people to say, don't clutter this. Do this and this and this. And I think there should be a couple of different templates that people use that they can obviously change with their own artwork and stuff like that. But 
the, you just don't want buy buttons left, right, and center on that. I think it's got to be a clean, slick experience. And uh, I think if the, if the artists are being given control of their own page, I think they probably need to be told about the things they shouldn't do just for their own benefit. It's not about them being censored or anything like that. It's just about them not looking like idiots. Right. <laughs> Of course, and uh, and uh, talking about uh, uh, you know Spotify and Beats, I can't really uh, avoid uh, mentioning Audio because they too this week uh, launched a new offering, which is a freemium offering in the US, uh, which was possible uh, possible due to its deal with the Cumulus Media uh, earlier last year uh, and uh, their advertising expertise. So it's essentially you know uh, Audio going the opposite direction from Beats, which is launching saying no, you have to pay this ten dollars a month or fifteen with the family plan on AT and T. Uh, audio now saying you can uh, uh, keep uh, being an Audio listener uh, on an ad free uh, ad funded uh, platform uh, for for free streams so uh, that's quite interesting of course we don't know what's going to happen with that it's only us at the moment and we don't know whether that's going to generate a lot of traffic for them uh, and how much cumulus is actually going to uh, push audio within its own uh, radio stations because that could prove to be a big winner but uh you know i, I guess we're just going to have to wait and see i don't know if you guys have any anything to say on that i just wanted to put it out there uh, just f as, as a as a as a fair uh, announcement as we talked about everybody else, right? I get the sense that RDO has battle fatigue. They've been at it for a while uh, and uh, their pace of development has slowed down and I know that uh, some key people were shifted onto other um, projects uh, uh, for Giannis Fries. Um, and I know that it's always really been driven personally by, by Giannis. Um, for example, a lot of the checks were written out of his personal checking account for a while. Right. Um, so I, I, I get the sense with the Cumulus deal that it's maybe about finding a new parent to be in love with RDL um, and um, maybe Cumulus sees on demand as a necessary part of, of their future. Um, and, um, and certainly, you know, the um, over-the-air um, uh, uh, broadcasters own the vast, vast majority of listener hours right now and have an incredible impact in the market that dwarfs anything Beats, Spotify, or Pandora can, can bring to market. So I wouldn't underestimate the potential impact of being adopted by Cumulus. Yeah, sure. And I mean, I, I can see it in, in my in, in the sort of tech community in the States, there's a, a very high rate of adoption of audio amongst, uh, you know, uh, tech journalists and podcasters and stuff. Uh, but whether that infiltrates in a wider sense in, in any way, I'm not sure. It's really, well, I'm, I've used audio a lot and the experience is really good. The desktop app's brilliant. The, uh, the smartphone app is, is light years ahead of what Spotify's doing or Deezer's doing. It's such a nice app. So yeah. I think uh, on a design level, so I'd, I would like to see kind of audio continue. But obviously, they've had to go this freemium route to compete with Spotify yeah. as well. So it's, 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 I guess it's they're kind of doubling down on, on the bat there because it's either do they just sit and go purely with uh, subscription. They had that kind of metered access thing where they would give you free access and then decide when, and when, you, when they would cut it off. Yeah. But I think it's that whole idea of the funnel. So how wide are you going to get the funnel to bring people in? But then how sustainable is the business model? Because for every free user, you're burning through through money. And yeah. what's the con what's the conversion rate going to be? But I think just as a as a user experience, I think audio is really good, and it would be a shame to go because it's 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 kind of the the benchmark for for services. Like I'll have to try out Beats music properly, but yeah. it's always the service I would mention as having the best user experience. Yeah. Yeah, sure. And actually, I forgot to mention earlier that there was a bit of a, a sort of a, a breaking news from uh, uh, Jana Stern uh, on uh, the Wall Street Journal uh, earlier today, as she wrote on her piece that uh, there was on Beats Music that she has seen the redesign of the new Spotify app. And she said it looks really good and it's going to launch uh, next month, according to, to what she knows. So that's something that I hadn't read anywhere else uh, yet, uh, anyway, unless I'd missed it. And so uh, that might be something that I just wanted to mention so that uh, user uh, listeners are up to date. Um, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I mean what, what, sorry, one more thing I wanted to add as well. I mean, it's, and it's, I think it's... It, Obviously, you've got the, the the freemium models at one end, and the sort of you know, I guess sort of aimed at a, a mainstream market or a younger market who are may, yeah. maybe uh, haven't got such deeper pockets. You've got you've got Ian Rogers, obviously, you know, very bullishly stating, you know, you, you, we want people spending um, um, nine ninety nine a month, and it's a paid for service. 
There was a really interesting survey that came out midweek um, from um, Alvarez and Marshall in um, um, looking more at the European market, but saying that a nine ninety nine um, per month um, price point is is too high. So if you halved it, it would grow the streaming market. And I think there's some there's some quite interesting conversations here going about you know who who are streaming services for what what prices should they should they be you know directed to and i think one 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 i guess one interesting um point here is 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 that when are when when are these services going to become a little bit more uh, different from each other and and also maybe try and upsell to people as well i mean i i'm always getting the feeling that i would pay more than 9.99 a month if I got this, if I got that, maybe if it was quality, maybe if it was exclusives. I, I, I find it quite strange in a way that there's not been that much conversation, apart from me and it beats, you know, being quite bullish about, you know, why you should be paying for something, but why there isn't more of a push about trying to get, you know, big music fans to pay a bit more on streaming services. Well, uh, uh, Topspin was all about price discrimination. Mm -hmm. right? So if you look at a release on Topspin, you'll see there's the dollar MP3 download, and there's a $3 FLAC download, there's $10 whatever, there's a $25 LP, and there's a $150 you know, date with a guitar player, or $5,000 date with a guitar player. And Topspin really went to price discrimination. Um, but so far, the on-demand streaming services have been serving fans, uh, you know, big fans, who are people that ordinarily spend quite a lot more than $10 a month. Um, and these people are now spending less than they used to spend. They're spending mm -hmm. 10 bucks, and they used to go spend $60. Certainly, that applies to me. Um, but the, the, the market, the scalable market, the one that will make David Lowry and David Byrne happy, um, is the one where you take the vast majority of people who are spending $5 a month on average. So it's, it's true that $10 is more than they're spending right now. And get them to spend, get the mass market to buy into this on-demand premium service uh, product model and get them to spend ten dollars a month and thereby grow the market as a whole. That probably would have the greatest possible impact on the total revenue pool that's coming into the music industry. Um, it's the most scalable market, but it's also true that big dollar specialty fans um, are out there to be served, and they, they to some extent they are served. So, for example, there's a classical streaming service that does a great job with classical metadata. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know fixing the playlists, which are just a disaster and an awful experience. And there's an opportunity for jazz fans to serve, you know, the individual players on the albums make a, make a difference, um, and so on. So, you know, so I, anyway. What, so what, so here's, 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 a, here's a hypothetical question. What would you, if you, if you were charged $20 for a streaming service, what would you, what would you pay, what would you pay for? Or, it's a big question, Mark, right? I would want, uh, well, obviously you'd want everything. You'd want high quality uh, audio. You would want exclusives. You would want extra content. You would want some form of video content as well, be that concerts or interviews or Q&As or things like that. Uh, you would perhaps also want a priority booking for concerts for acts that you've signed up to, so whether or not... They, they kind of hold back a certain number of tickets so that if you're, it's almost like being in a fan club. So you kind of, you choose the acts that you're the fan club of. So you get news feeds within that. I think maybe even kind of stuff outside of music itself, maybe documentaries, that kind of thing, kind of rolled into it uh, as well. So I think for somebody like me who pays for uh, a streaming service, I think, I think 120 pounds a year is an absolute bargain. And I would... Mm -hmm easily pay three times that and not feel the pain i think uh not that i want them to triple my uh <laughs> my, my, my direct yeah. debit you're gonna get a surprise but, next but, month but, but, I, I but pay $20 for what i get right now it's yeah. worth that to me yeah but i'm 41 and i've been working for a number of years but if i was 18 and really obsessed with music 120 pounds a year if i was a student is just that's that's kind of my food for my food for the term that's a huge amount of money that i so i wouldn't i couldn't but, but, I mean, but, but one of the you know one of one of the universal things with music and again you know pre pre-digital it was all about you know announcing an album and you know the album be released but beforehand you were you were bottling up the excitement and that's what you were selling and it's like you can you can obviously still create that excitement you know beyonce created that excitement releasing you know dropping her album out you know bowie did obviously radiohead in rainbows you know they, they it was the excitement that created which was the really important thing and it's like you can if you can if you can still do that and and 
you can and you know you've got these you know potentially high paying um, fans out there it just seems within the realms of possibility that you know you can start incorporating these things into a you know into a streaming service and look into you know looking to upsell a lot more instead of this just 999 identikit market or just pushing you know we we have we have to have it you know have to have the price lower for a, you know for a mainstream fan i don't know it's it's it well, just seems within the realms of possibility yeah iTunes had been able to do that even though they started off with the 99 cent download they went up for kind of new releases and big hits and they went down for catalogs so i think that why, why they launched with a kind of very rigid, it's 99 cents for everything. They, uh, they adapted that model, and I think the, the subscription model could, could handle that as well. I think what they should be doing is looking at the really heavy consumers and uh, perhaps just speaking to them and saying, what would you pay for? What is it you want? So they go and they, they look at the top 1% of their users and just go, what extra stuff do you want? And how much would you pay for it? And then building a service around that because so i think there, there's a huge opportunity because that there's that idea that uh there's just one kind of business model for the consumers and there isn't yeah. so yeah. i think in the same way that there will be people who will never ever pay ten dollars a month for music because they don't listen to enough music to justify that because they maybe buy one album every three years yeah, so sure. they're spend on music three dollars a year yeah so, absolutely. i mean I, I think it's a mistake to think of the music industry as a monolithic entity sure um, it is composed of individual entrepreneurs who have their own market strategy, whether that is um, getting booked to be a DJ for a night, certainly a fine way to make a living for some specific people, people who are uh, uh, selling music to, to children. Kids' music is a distinct market, a distinct approach. Um, there are you know, many wedding musicians, guitar teachers, uh, people who do soundtracks, people who make their money on commercials. The important thing is to establish a platform that allows each of these entrepreneurs um, to have a healthy economy in which to work. So uh, transparent contracts, protection of the law. Um, uh, so, for example, if you really want to serve music entrepreneurs, um, the, uh, the law should make it impossible to sign a deal where you can't audit. You should, it should be impossible to sign away your audit rights. Because that way, when an artist goes into a negotiation and they have no negotiating power at all, they're still at least protected in that way. Yeah, that's um, So, and, and some artists would benefit a lot from serving super fans, right? Here's the service that costs $100 a month as opposed to $10 a month. Yeah. Um, but only a few artists, and so they would need to be served. Absolutely. Uh, well, I think uh, Lucas has to go in a second, and uh, I think we should wrap up the show anyway. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, there's a few things that we didn't manage to talk about, uh, but I, I hopefully will be able to catch up on them this week. This, uh, the, this uh, show was mostly dedicated to streaming, but uh, first up, uh, thanks so much, Lucas, and I'd like to plug uh, your company, which uh, is, uh, if you remind us, uh, uh, secondline.tv, right? That's right. Secondline.tv, we do online streaming of live events, pay-per-view. Awesome. Our, that's right. And um, you, can, uh, you can see uh, our website at secondline.tv or 2ln.tv if you don't feel like typing so much. That's perfect. And uh, Amon, uh, for you, it's musically.com, uh, right? Yeah, that's, uh, that's one of my homes. <laughs> Great. Uh, and uh, uh, anything else, uh, Amon, that you wanted to plug for the show? Uh, oh, God, well, Kim. I always blindside you with that. <laughs> yeah, Kim.com. Uh, my website you can read his his lengthy words about uh, where he's going okay awesome yeah absolutely I'll, I'll post the link in the show notes and adam anything for you for your end uh nothing specific to plug at the moment actually though but great. um thanks for asking that's great awesome well thanks so much guys for joining me and it was a real pleasure having you on and thanks so much for listening you can find all about the show on digitalmusictrans.com in a couple of weeks i'll be covering medium in depth so, so you can l keep an eye on the site on digitalmusictrans.com to find all the interviews that i'm going to be doing uh, over in Cannes. thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and until next time and that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.